You're listening to NGSC Sports Radio. Hear us live on NGSCSports.com where you can get awesome analysis for all things sport. Or check out our podcasts on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and much more. For our latest videos, head to NGSC Sports YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at NGSC Sports and like us on Facebook. NGSC Sports. We never stop. I know it's 1 a.m. in uh, England, or 3 a.m., but I don't care. This is what they need to play a match. All right, Kenny, he beat Joe Hart. Of course he beat Joe Hart. Wait, Joe Hart's back on City? Uh, well, you know, he was on loan last year, so. Oh, I guess he was. No, nobody's bought him yet. <laughs> Sadio, 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 Sadio. That's actually hilarious. I didn't even think oh. about that. Goodness. I, yeah, soon when I turned around, I was like, wait, what the? Oh, God, it's JJ. <laughs> and his beautiful hair. Oh, no God, Liverpool, Liverpool. Liverpool is literally in mid season. God, we should have had five goals. Oh, for no. Our... oh no. By the way, um, Mo Salah came on and within a minute had a goal. <laughs> because he's Mo Salah. So we're going to win this two to one with goals from Salah and Mane, because of course that's how we do. Wait, what that's is, how what we is this, do. What is this airing on? Huh? What is this airing on? Oh, okay. Uh, Espen the dose. Like, uh, I was like, why is why can I not find this? And then I was like, oh, it's because um, uh, the first thing I see is Athletics Rangers. Because sure, why not? That's on Espen. This is Espen Dose. Oh, goodness. I'm ready to go ahead and call it. We're fine. Callie, if that starts, you got to be quiet now. That means no playing on that board. You need to get up here and go to sleep. Because you know we got to get up and go to the beach in the morning. Okay, you put it away so you don't make noise with it. Such a good child. She tries to be such a good child, but she'll do something to make a ton of noise, I know. You can do it, Boogie. Hold on real quick. Where are you going to sleep? In there, but Mom's going to go inside. Okay. Well, I'm going to sleep on the couch. Well, okay, so are you going to lay down now, or what's your gimmick? I'm just going to play with pickles. You're going to play with pickles? All right, just be quiet, okay, because we're about to start. And luckily for me, I take this so I can rewatch the entire match. Why does this field look like absolute trash? Uh, because it's like MetLife. <laughs> Wait, this is MetLife? Uh, yes, that's MetLife. Well, well, but, but nobody's playing on it. I guess they're getting right. ready for football. But, but, but. It looks horrendous. Oh God, I, I mean, I, my brain is broken horrible. right now. It's like brutally horrible looking. Like I mean, the only thing I can think is that uh, I mean, without going back and listening to the entire commentary, and hopefully they say something about it. Ian Dark and Paul Mariner. By the way, on the call tonight, right? Paul Mariner's horrendous. Ian Dark's god likes as usual. But I mean, the only thing I can think of is that you know they're just they put something temporary down just to try to extend the field out. I guess. But, I mean, it looks like shit. Charlotte looked, Charlotte looked pretty good. Uh-huh. This looks like crap. Yeah, that did not look good at all. Oh, my God. That's all I can think because I'm the way I'm looking at it, I'm back in the beginning of it. Just looking at it, it's almost like it's at, at like, the hash marks. Yeah. Like, like, there's just these, like, almost evenly distributed yellow patches. Yeah. So I don't know, man. I don't know what it is. That's really gross. Uh, well, I mean, it's New Jersey. What do you expect? Yeah, that's true. You, you expect about as much <laughs> as you'd expect from the Foreign Affair podcast. Jesus. No, you expect more from us in that's, the state of New Jersey. That's Come actually on. true. That is that is sadly true. Welcome to the Foreign Affair podcast, episode 220. Just 200 away from our magic podcast. 
Uh, I am oh. Edward Green. <laughs> that's that's a joke for no joke for no one. Uh, I am Edward Green. Joined as always by my call in crime Wes Bradshaw. Uh, excellent podcast on tap for you today, everybody. Uh, we are going to be diving back into the 2017-18 Premier League season. We're going to be doing teams. 11 through 7 or 6. I will we'll decide once we get there uh, if we're going to do 6 this there, week. Edward, there's week. a big crowd now. <laughs> yeah, let's just do this. Let's just do the top 6 next week. All right. So we're we're going to do top 6 next week, so we're going to we're going to do 11 yeah. through 7 this week. Um, and yeah. we're we're going to get through that and then we're going to hit the news and notes, so some big news and notes to get through, uh, some big uh, transfer talk happening. Um, we'll also have, of course, watch for and dare I say, an evolution of so raw. And not only do we have some evolving news, but we also have the build up to SummerSlam. Oh, magic, magic, magic! I to- told you guys, we've, we've been promising this for a while. Big so raw coming up. We were just waiting. We were just waiting for right. this. We knew. We knew before Stephanie McMahon knew. Come on. Come on, guys. You should Let's call it insider, folks. Why would I bore you with oh. crap July WWE television when I can save these big things for you? It's, it's obvious. You should trust us by now, folks. Uh, just like obvious. NGSC Sports, because uh, that's who's presenting this podcast. And at NGSC Sports, we never stop, except for that time we stopped doing so raw. And then we brought it back because it's evolution. And of, and of course, you should trust us like the International Champions Cup trusted us to give us press passes. Mm. Oh, wait, you can all kiss our ass. I felt I felt like some, I, I don't know if you've been on Twitter in like the last half hour or so, I felt like tweeting something really catty out. Because uh, Arlo White, our, our lovely Arlo White, um, <sighs> tweeted out a little while ago, and I'm going to I'm going to pull this up here. Um, why aren't these international champions cup games selling out? Like, apparently, I guess they're selling out media row, but I guess yeah, they're not totally. selling out of people. Oh. Yeah, the media room, the media room selling out. It's almost like if you charge two hundred dollars to see a bunch of B teams playing after the World Cup on a shit turf in New Jersey, people are gonna want to go. But you know where they will go? They will go to Charlotte because North Carolina loves our pro football. Uh, let me actually look. I I'm actually curious. Um, I want to say I don't think that I don't think it was a full sellout, but I'm 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 pretty damn sure there was fifty thousand plus there. Oh, that's actually kind of low for Charlotte. Well, I mean, I, I could be on the low. I, I, I think, I think compared to because I think when we were in Charlotte for like Liverpool, wasn't it like sixty six, sixty eight? Might have been. Um, I, and I know there was a lot. There was a lot of pub for Liverpool, obviously. With oh, of course. I mean, it, it was it was last time we were there. Um, yeah. Let me let me see if I can pull this up. I, I do have the Wikipedia page up. Um, let's see. They have okay. Let's they have attendance numbers. Fun. Yeah. So fifty five thousand four forty seven. Uh, was the attendance at Bank of America, Bank of America, mm-hmm. with a, a max of 75,000. So that's 20,000 under capacity. Um, yeah. And, and just to go back, let's go back to 2016. 2016, real quick, was, was it, wasn't was even that good. That was uh, Baron versus uh, Ace, uh, Inter, right? No, yes. yes. No, PSG, yeah. Yeah, a PSG was the year before. So it was Bayern versus Inter. Yeah. So 53,000 for Bayern Inter. And, like, I don't even think, like, they're that good. Let me see if I can pull up. Uh, 14 was Liverpool. Um, uh-huh. So let's go real quick to that one. That was Liverpool versus Milan. Bank of America, 69,000 people. There you go. So... Unless uh, there's... tonight tonight's attendance was fifty two six thirty five at uh, MetLife, and so MetLife and the important thing about that is to know what is MetLife's actual cap. Um, yeah, don't worry, we're actually going to start the podcast in a minute, folks. Don't worry. Sure. Um, uh, that's sure. MetLife. So what would you say it was? What fifty uh, fifty two six somewhere in that so range. That's almost thirty thousand below capacity for MetLife. So you had about three thousand more in Charlotte. Yeah. You know, well, I, I'll say this: I don't know, I don't know if this would have filled twenty thousand seats, but um, you know, one thing with Charlotte, it is a Sunday evening. True. Yeah. People got to go to work on Monday, and two, you know, Charlotte's one of those where 
And from things I heard, I've heard about Charlotte, there were people from all over basically the South who came to Charlotte. That makes sense. I mean, there were, uh, there were people from Alabama and this, I heard this on the Anfield rap. They were talking about, you know, we talked to fans from Alabama, uh, Tennessee, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, you know, Charlotte's just one of those places where it's located Mm -hmm. where you have major highways like from everywhere that go to Charlotte. And so it is it is kind of an easy easy one to get to from a lot of places in the southeast. And I will the, – the way that they are kind of also sort of concentrated in the northeast, uh, you do have mm-hmm. a couple to go through. I am going to say, yeah. though, uh, also tonight was Juventus Bayern Munich, uh, right. two league title winners. Um, that was at – in uh, LFP or whatever, the, the Eagles Stadium in Philadelphia. Uh, Lincoln, uh, yeah, Lincoln Financial, Lincoln Financial. Oh. That was uh, that's a capacity of sixty nine thousand. They got thirty two. Well, and I'm going to say this night, too, but ugh. yeah. Now, now I'm going to say this too, though. Um, when when you start, yeah, I'm, that's what I'm kind of surprised about the um, city Liverpool crowd a little bit mm-hmm. because the simple fact that I think it's obvious your other than say Madrid or Barcelona, your um, Premier League teams are going to be your big draws, sure. because obviously that's who ninety percent of soccer fans in the states they they follow the Premier League. Mm-hmm. You know that's their main league they follow because obviously it's the easiest one to watch. Right. So you know when you start looking at United and Liverpool and City, um, you know those are where you would figure you're going to get your crowds. Obviously you put Barca or Madrid. And, um, you know, you're going to get good crowds off of that. But, uh, you know, I think another thing is with it being a World Cup year, you know, in the past, you know, we would go to these. I mean, when we went to the first Liverpool and even the last Liverpool, we or, or not the last, well, obviously the first Liverpool and these other ones we've been to, you know, we saw a lot more of the players. Sure. Uh, Gerard and, played, I believe, the second half. Uh, yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, you know, Zlatan, Stevie was the big one. <laughs> Zlatan, yeah, of course. Uh, Zlatan yeah. started uh, the PSG game against Chelsea. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, Chelsea started most of their guys or had most of their guys playing that. Mm-hmm. And really, I think a lot of it is um, is kind of due to the World Cup is you don't have, you know, one thing I don't think you have this summer just, well, oh, my God, just give me football. Yeah. Just give me football. I need football. I mean, you know, we're all kind of coming in. I mean, literally, the World Cup has been over for two weeks. Yeah, yeah. Week and a half, yeah. I mean, the guys who were in the later rounds, the England players aren't back yet. The Belgians aren't back. Mm -hmm. Uh, Obviously, the French and the Croats aren't back, you know. Um, uh, Shakiri has just joined up with Liverpool. Mm -hmm. And, of course, his team, you know, Firmino, I don't believe Firmino's back yet, so the Brazilian players aren't back yet. Uh, so you know you're missing some star power, but I, I just think, I think it, it, it's it's kind of like the ICC may be suffering in the same way that you know the transfer market is. As in, damn, you know we just we're, we're kind of up against it <laughs> because this entire month was kind of taken out from us. I think the- so. I think that and I mean when when you start denying the most popular podcast in the Balkan region, <laughs> I mean there are obvious reverberations from this. They, our, our fans have spoken with their wallets. Yeah. Um, All right. Uh, I, I will say this: I think the one then if, to see how big of a factor this uh-huh. is, the one to keep an eye on is this Saturday, twenty eighth of Saturday, correct? Yes, <laughs> uh, um, yeah. and that is. That is United yeah. Liverpool at Michigan Stadium in Ann Arbor. And um, that one in Ann Arbor, you know, they've been really selective with that match. Yeah. Because that one has drawn massive. I mean, A, a you know, Michigan Stadium holds, God, I think about 110,000. Uh, 107. Yep. You know, one, I mean, it's a massive state. It's one of the biggest, I think it's the second biggest basically football stadium we had in the country. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I think the only one bigger is in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. Um, 
and they have put marquee matchups there. I believe the first year they did it, it was uh, Real and Man U. Mm-hmm. I believe Barcelona's played there. I mean, you know, they put the big ones there. And really, there's no bigger game in English football than Liverpool Man United. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I think one thing that's probably helped some tonight is seeing Mane and Salah. That might help some late ticket sales because they're like, well, hey, you know, Liverpool's going to have their guys there. But, you know, really, I mean, when you look across at United, as Josie has constantly whined and pointed out, mm-hmm. he has no players. Uh, you know, um, so, I mean, we're going to be without mainly the United stars. Mm-hmm. Hooray. So, shall we actually start the podcast now? Sure, why not? All right, let's actually start getting into this um, with our 2017-18 Premier League wrap-up. Uh, again, teams 11 through 7 we're doing today. Uh, let's start with the 11th place team, uh, and that is, oh, sweet lady Rebecca's Crystal Palace. Uh, the Eagles, through five, the first five <laughs> matches of the league, had zero points and zero goals. Frank DeBoer's experiment was literally in shambles. He was fired. And then it's, oh, well, Crystal Palace definitely, definitely going to de- gonna get relegated now. And who comes riding to the rescue? Good old boy. Boy Hodgson. Turns, boy. <laughs> turns everything around and gets Palace all the way up to 11th place. Uh, 12 wins, 8 draws, 18 losses. Uh, very, very top-heavy league this year. Um, but, but Wes, again, this is a team that, again, was 5 And after that start, went 12-8-13 the rest of the way. Very respectable last 33 matches of the of this season. I mean, this is, this is one of those things where, yeah, you know, you, you finish mid-table. You obviously started very poorly you didn't make it very deep into like any any one uh competition um so that's there's not a whole lot to do there i think though from where they could have been i'm going to give them a b minus because they do finish mid table and and again that start was absolutely atrocious they could have just folded it in they didn't get a win until match eight so this is this was easily a team that could have just folded up shop midway through the season we're still in last place let's take it to the house and they finished in 11th i'm gonna give them a b minus i'm not going any higher because that team should have been better but they just had such a bad start so i'm giving b minus and it was confirmed the worst start in premier league history (laughs) Um, I mean, the knives were out. Everybody was done with Palace. Um, Palace somehow did it. I, I, I'll give Roy credit. You know how much I you have love to. Roy. Yeah. How much I just love Roy. Um, but, you know, not only that, he came in with a terrible start. His main striker, I believe, Ben Teke scored three goals this season, I think. I'm going to take a quick look. And I don't think he scored his first goal until literally nearly around Christmas. Mm-hmm. And it was a penalty. <laughs> they were like, just fucking score, do something. Also dude. missed a penalty. To, that could have won yeah. him a game. I remember that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was terrible. Missed a few penalties this year, <laughs> including earlier than that when they were actually trying, look, just get a goal. Yeah. And he goes up, takes a penalty, and stoinks it. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so their main striker was horrendous. Palace had tried to pump some money in over the last few years, and unfortunately for them, their money signings were abysmal dog shit. But there was a shining star amongst the muck that was Crystal Palace's season, and that was the prodigal son who had returned, I believe, a year before. But uh, Wilfred Zaha, Mm -hmm. who had a, you know, had a really good season when you, you know, he's kind of like Zern Shakiri in a way. When you turn around and you look at, what he had to deal with. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had a fantastic season. Yeah, he really did. And I think Zaha's, I think there was one point where they had not, and it was like late into the season, they had not won a match or won a point 
Maybe they had not won a single match without Zaha. Mm-hmm. Even though I want to say it was a point, they had not won a point without Zaha in the side. I believe that. Until late on. I mean, he was he was everything to them this year. And, uh, the, you know, the rumor, the transfer rumors, he may be, could be on his way to Spurs mm-hmm. is one that's out there. Um, but that would be a huge loss for them going into next year because – it's not exactly like Palace have been pulling up trees uh, in the transfer market themselves. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, unless they're waiting to get that Zaha money and go shopping, um, that, that would be a massive, massive loss for them. But, you know, Roy Hodgson, Roy is good at what he's good at. Mm-hmm. Um, just, you know, don't give him a team with any real expectations or talent yeah. because he's going to screw that up every time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Roy is – he's solid. He brings solidity to a team. And he's kind of like Big Sam. He he doesn't get relegated. Mm-hmm. And that was exactly what Palace needed this year. Now, unlike Sam Allardyce, who went and became maybe an even bigger public enemy while at Everton, um, Roy pulled the right switches, made the right moves, kept Palace up, and actually got them, you know, into – into a good spot considering their start. So, you know, where we're going to talk about Everton in a little bit, and, you know, we're going to hammer Sam Allardyce. Yeah. We're not going to hammer Roy. I thought Roy did a really good job. He, he did what he's there to do, which is solidify a relegation threatened side and get somewhere into the mid-table. Also, I, I do need to make a correction – I said that uh, I gave Palace's record wrong. I actually gave Newcastle's record when I mentioned it. They went, oh, okay. Palace went 11, 11, and 16 on the season, which means that after Frank DeBoer left, they went 11, 11, 11. Like, I, 11s are winners, man. Absolutely. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Great job, though. Again, I wholeheartedly agree with Roy Hodgson, uh, or sorry, with you about Roy Hodgson. Uh, tremendous job, very, very well done, keeps them up for another season. And in, in, in what looks like, especially this year, it's going to be a very tough Premier League, um, just top to bottom. And we'll obviously get to that uh, later on in the next couple, over the next couple weeks and as, as we start the season. But, man, this, this looks like a loaded Premier League coming up, um, even oh, with, yeah. with some of the teams. So. Uh, let's move on to 10th place. Now Newcastle uh, also finished on 44 points, uh, right back up from one year down in the championship. Again, finished 12, 8, and 18 on the season. Uh, had some uh, very good moments. Uh, Rafa Benitez stayed on even through the championship after coming on in their doomed campaign a few years ago late on. Uh, stayed on and really guided this team back up. Um, again, finished uh, very, very well. Uh, in the top 10, I think that's about as good as you could hope for coming back up from the championship. Um, as, we, as we take a look at some of their things, uh, didn't go, uh, went one and done in the League Cup, went two and done in the FA Cup. Um, kind, of, kind of a bummer there, especially when you start the League Cup with Nottingham Forest. Um, but again, some, some decent wins on the season. Uh, they did get a win at home against Manchester United, 1-0. And I don't know if you can call it decent, but they beat Arsenal 2-1 at home as well. And then ended the season with a 3-0 drubbing of Chelsea. Um, so again, for Rafa Benitez, first season back up in the Prem with his team to get a top 10 finish as, as top heavy as this year was in the Premier League. I think that's a fantastic job. I'm going to give Newcastle a B plus on the season. Um, I have no problem with a B plus. Um, I actually, I feel pretty vindicated. I, I picked them to finish ninth this year. There you go. Um, kind of shockingly in the top half. And once again, you know, it can all come back to, man, the bottom of the Premier League was weak this year. That is true, yeah. Because Newcastle were not what you would call a good team. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a team that's crying out for some investment. And unfortunately, Mike Ashley can't figure out how the hell to sell the team. That's very true. Um, so, I mean, still going forward, Newcastle Newcastle are still kind of a team that are kind of teetering right there mm-hmm. where it could fall apart for Newcastle. Sure. But at this point, it hasn't. 
Um, and really a good solid year. They, they did enough mm-hmm. yes. <laughs> and even finished 10th. I mean, of all things, but they, they did enough for the season. And, um, you know, Rafa's sticking around for another year. It's just, it's going to be interesting to see what happens with this team that just isn't really putting much back into it. Yeah. Like they need to be. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to have to make some moves because they do have a decent core, but, uh, there are, there are definitely some upgrades that have to be made, uh, especially in the goal scoring department, 39 goals. Uh, that was second worst among top 10 clubs and even among the top 15, that was third worst. Only only ahead of Brighton and Hove, and a team we'll get to a little later on. So yes, definitely some improvement there uh, needs to be made, but also only gave up 47 goals, which was the best out of the bottom uh, 12, I guess we'll call it. Yes, bottom 13, bottom 13. That was the best uh, goals against Mark. So some stuff to build on there, but investments, as you said, Wes, must be made. Um, As we head over to our ninth place team, where some investments may also have to be made after some things that have happened in the transfer market for them this year, the Foxes. Now two years removed from their Cinderella season. Uh, They have not quite turned back uh, into a pumpkin, but they are starting to falter just a little bit. And we'll have to see if some moves they make this summer can help prop them back up. But Leicester City, uh, they get 47 points on the season to finish in ninth place in the table. Uh, not a bad season. They, again, I, I feel like saying that a lot with these mid-table clubs. Not a bad season, but not a particular great one either. Uh, they were not in any European competition after making the quarterfinals of the Champions League the previous season. Uh, They did uh, make a decently uh, nice run in both of the Cups, uh, made it to the quarterfinals uh, of both the League Cup and the FA Cup, losing Chelsea in the FA and Manchester City in the League Cup, League Cup on penalties no less. So not a terrible uh, job by them. Also played one of the most entertaining matches of the year last week of the season, going 5-4 with Tottenham. Um, But, you know, Jamie Vardy... He's he's obviously we, we make the joke about Harry Kane being the one season wonder. Jamie Vardy has a little bit of that to him. Not a terrible player, but definitely not hitting the heights that he did a couple of seasons ago. Obviously, feeling still the loss of N'Golo Kante, keeping that midfield strong. They did bring in some decent players like Kilichi and Nacho uh, from Manchester City, as well as a couple others. Uh, but Wes, I'm going to give Leicester. A solid B on the season. Um, I think maybe a little more is still expected of them, having just won the title a couple years ago, even if it was in the most unlikely of circumstances. Um, but not bad, again, to finish in the top 10. But still, I, I think, you know, with, with switching managers in the middle of the season as, as well, can't go up too much higher than a B. So I'm going to say B overall for the Foxes. Right. I mean, um, we're, we're finally kind of seeing this whole thing come back to earth. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a couple of years ago, the likes of Robert Huth and Wes Morgan just had once in a lifetime seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, everything went for Vardy. Uh, Rian Mares was happy yeah. <laughs> uh, and was just at his, at his absolute best. Um, Danny Drinkwater had a huge year. And oh, oh yeah, they had this guy named N'Golo Conte. Yeah, people look no a lot better when they play with him. Yeah, who no one had ever heard of at that time. <laughs> and now within two years, it's like the best, well, Neymar and Mbappe are just begging for it. Conte. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like openly, please buy this guy and bring him to our club. Um, I, it, was, it was a perfect storm for Leicester. It was a season where, A, no one was looking at him. Um, B, it was the ultimate Cinderella story. And C, they had a handful of guys who just completely burst on the scene. Mm -hmm. Um, And once Conte was gone, that team, it it really lost. You know, we talked about the defense the year they won the title. Well, Conte was obviously a massive part of that. I mean, if not the biggest massive part of that. So, I mean, you know, it's what it is. Um, 
I think Leicester still for, you know, for their size and stature all time in English football, Mm -hmm. they may still be somewhat punching above their weight. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's become a tough place. You know, going to the King Power is not an easy place to play. Um, You know, they've become a a bogey team for some teams. But, you know, this this coming season is going to be a lot different. You know, obviously, uh, Mares is gone. He's at City now. Um, I want to believe that they actually – Robert Hoof is gone as well now. Uh, obviously, Drinkwater's gone. Conte's gone. Uh, they're on their second second manager since yeah. – um, uh, well, Clive Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it, it's what it is. And it was, a, it was a fantastic season that they had, obviously. But I think we're kind of seeing more – of what to actually expect from Leicester. And they're, they're making some changes. You know, Casper Schmeichel could still be gone before the season starts. Mm-hmm. Obviously, he was a big part. He was a big breakout star that season and had a great World Cup this year for uh, Denmark. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, he could be gone. They've, they've made some moves. They brought in Danny Ward from Liverpool, um, you know, to – Obviously, to be the backup keeper, but if you know Schmeichel goes, I guess Ward's going to step in and be the number one. Uh, there's talk out there that they're at maybe after Danny Ings, mm-hmm. which you know, what does that kind of mean in Jamie Vardy terms? Um, I, I wouldn't be shocked at the end of the day if Vardy's not there to start the season. That's yeah, so I mean, it's just kind of it's kind of the reality of being Cinderella. I mean, it's awesome to have that season, but it's kind of proven that unless you have massive um, infrastructure, which basically means you have a sheik by your team, you're just, you're not going to make the move to be year in year out title contenders. Well, and, and what I wanted to ask you is, is there any danger of, of Lester kind of becoming the new Southampton? A little bit. Um, the only difference is, you know, Southampton just has that long tradition of kind of loading up and then selling those guys for high prices. Mm-hmm. With Leicester, it just seems like it's more been a, you know, almost like we they just had a special class. Mm-hmm. You know, um, you know, like if you wanted to compare it, say, to college basketball. Let's just say college basketball because you can go to a class. You know, Michigan had the Fab Five. Mm-hmm. Other than those guys, after that, they didn't really do shit for like 20 years. <laughs> you know, it wasn't like it was year in, year out. They were bringing in these great players. You know, and I think that's more the thing with Southampton is, you know, Southampton every year or two, they're selling guys for big money because they're kind of plucking these diamonds. Mm-hmm. And polishing them. Lester basically did it for about a two-year run. Okay. And really, truthfully, other than Conte and maybe Mares, mm-hmm. I mean, who else has really been good? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Drinkwater was – I don't even remember Drinkwater playing much last year. Yeah. You know, Vardy doesn't look like a guy who – I mean, let's put it like the top six didn't back in for Vardy this year. Yeah. The only time you hear Vardy in the top six is like, well, you know, he could be a change of pace. He could be a plan B. Yeah. So, you know, you're not – I just don't think you're looking at the wholesale top-to-bottom talent production like you're getting from Southampton. That said, I know exactly what you mean when you say that. Yeah. So we'll we'll have to see how they uh, how they do this year again with the loss of Riyad Mahrez. Um, now, Wes, a team that I'm sure will bring you absolutely no joy to talk about ever whatsoever in their misery. Oh, uh, we have to go to eighth place of the blue side of mercy. With Everton. Mercy, mercy me! It was not a good season for Everton. Uh, an 18th place as late as week 10 outside of the top 10 as late as week 14 actually as late as week 29 really when they were in 11th um this was a very bad season for everton um ronald kuman 
fired on October 23rd, never really got this team going, um, had a set of three straight losses near the beginning of the season to Chelsea, Tottenham, and Manchester United, which you're like, okay, you know, that I guess that's it. Even drew against Man City in week two, and you're like, well, that's that's not too bad. But they also lost to Everton, or sorry, they lost to Arsenal. They lost to Burnley, both of those at home. They go on the road, and they lose to Leicester. Just not a good season for them. They lose uh, in the first round of the FA Cup to Liverpool on a dramatic uh, Virgil van Dijk goal. They lose in the second round of the League Cup to Chelsea. And in the Europa League, after having to uh, go through multiple qualifying rounds, uh, they get into the group stage and proceed to lose four of their first five matches, uh, including some very ugly scenes at home in their last one against Atalanta. Um, just really terrible stuff. Get knocked out of Europa. Um, uh, you know, they, they go through. They finally have to bring in Sam Allardyce. Fans revolt. <laughs> not playing good football. Just, uh, they, they brought in Wayne Rooney. They brought in Gilfie Sigurdsson. Uh, they brought in Davy Klassen, uh, all these guys for a lot of money. Uh, they brought in Theo Walcott mid season, which actually wasn't that bad. Um, they brought in Michael mm-hmm. Keane from Burnley. They brought in Jordan Pickford, who was terrible until he became England's number one. Um, so this was just for the money spent and for all the terribleness that went on with this club to not make a European spot. To not contend in anything, I am giving Everton an F. They failed this season. There you go, Wes. Just say it. They fucking sucked. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, Sink to Sun looks pretty good, though, but other than that, nothing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So many moves. So many moves, so many names brought in by Everton. You know, Ed, they got that money. Yeah. Woo, woo, woo. Ah! <laughs> Love that money. And they got it in, and they were, they were, they, there was going to be a blue revolution on Merseyside, Ed, because they were opening the checkbook. Oh, boy. And they were giving money to Coop. Let's look at They brought in Jordan Pickford, we know. Umar Niasi, uh, David Clawson, Michael Keane, Sandro. Mm-hmm. Yes. One name, so you know he's got to be good, Sandro. Of course. Waza, Kjofi Sigurdsson, and Nikola Vlasic. Uh, that was your summer spending. And then in uh, January, they brought in Cenk Tolson, Theo, and Alikia Mangala mm. on loan from uh, City. A lot of big names there for Everton. A lot of money spent. Yeah. A lot of money spent. A lot of money wasted. Yeah. Because holy shit, that team was poorly put together. Yeah, it was. Davy Clawson is one of the worst Premier League signings. Well, we'll say of last season. You never know what might happen. But he, he, I mean, he's going down as he's he's a bust right now. He's mm-hmm. terrible. Mm-hmm. Um. Pickford. Uh, I don't put much on Pickford. I thought Pickford had a good, as good a season as he could okay. with that horrendous defense in front of him, especially early on. Yeah, um, Pickford was fine. I mean, that wasn't a bad sign, and Pickford was fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but my God, the, just the the cherry on top of this shit Sunday mm-hmm. was our boy Wayne Rooney. Oh boy! Oh my! I mean, we. This this like the whole signing was universally panned when it happened. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyone other than Everton fans could get over the fact. It's like, wait a minute, why are you spending money for this guy? <laughs> he is garbage. I mean, look at him at United. He was horrible at United with infinitely better talent around him and a much better manager. I mean, what did you all expect? And when Rooney comes in and sucks, and then literally they gave him away to MLS. Yeah. That's the best part. Just he, he went on a free to MLS. That's how bad this that's how bad this whole thing was. Um Kuman 
didn't survive because, you know, that, that's the thing. Kuman picked these players. He picked the players he wanted, and then they were garbage. Um, Everton thought they had some massive coup when they when Michael Keane signed and didn't go to Liverpool, even though I don't think Liverpool were ever really, uh, no pun intended, keen on mm-hmm. Michael. Um, but then, the, then, then I keep saying the cherry on top of this, Fifty million for Gilfie Sigurdsson. Yeah, I mean, you know, and we can talk about the Richarlison deal that they've just made as well, well which we'll is talk, another. Don't, don't worry, that's in news and notes. Okay, but I mean, basically, Everton are throwing this money out there. It's not like anyone's going against them. Mm-hmm. They're driving up their own prices here. No one else is in on these guys. Not to take anything away from Richarlison, which once again we'll get to. I mean, no one else was in for Gilfie Sigurdsson. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a guy who had gone to Spurs, had failed to impress, had gone back to his original club. No one else is, oh, God, we got we to gotta pay 40, 45 million pounds for Gilfie Sigurdsson. Mm-hmm. This is just Everton out there just throwing money, thinking, oh, we'll throw money at it. That'll work. Yeah, because that's work for everyone, right? And then um, – you know, Arsenal finally get them to take one of their mistakes off their hands in Theo. You say Theo and Beth, I think he scored like twice. He was crap. He, he was, he's, I think he scored in the first match and then might not have scored yeah. again. Yeah, and then didn't score again until like May. Yeah. I mean, he was, he was crap. Mongolo was crap. Oh, man. And then, oh, geez, how many cherries are going to be on this, on this Sunday? Because then they go out and they try to hire a manager midseason. Yeah. And they completely – now, granted, they did finally get the guy they wanted all along in Marco Silva. Yeah. Um, but during the season, they fucked that up. They went after two or three other guys, and then just nothing your fan base loves to hear more than, well, we found a manager in Sam Allardyce. Woohoo! Especially when you're a club who has some sort of ambition to you. Yeah. Which, granted, Everton did have ambition. That's why they spent that money. And then you hand it over to Sam Allardyce, who, you know, the 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 pie-eating piper of uh, should-be Real Madrid fame. Um, and he comes in and he, now oh, here's the thing, you know, kind of like we said about Roy earlier. He does what Sam Allardyce does. He comes in. He plays extremely negative football. Um, he parks the bus in every match, even when he's got a more talented team. Yeah. So that's the thing with Sam. But that, that's why he can never succeed at Madrid. He just, he has no idea how to play when he has a better team than somebody else. I mean, that's his biggest problem. Mm-hmm. But they play just the most drab, dull, horrible football on earth this side of Man United. And then it gets it's made even worse for him because then right across Stanley Park is a Liverpool team that's got, you know, Sun said the most explosive attack on earth. <laughs> and has and is going to the Champions League final. <laughs> so I mean there was nothing went right for Everton this year. Yeah. Yes, they finished eighth, which, you know, that's kind of a normal Everton spot. But they took they took one of the most horrendous routes to get there that anyone's ever taken. It was a horrible, miserable year on the blue side of Mersey. I was really beyond all belief hoping that Allardyce was retained. But alas, they do get Marco Silva, which I think should definitely help. Yeah. Um, but that said, they, they need to, they need some, they need surgery done to that roster. Mm-hmm. Let's put it this way. They need internal organs replaced and they just got a big set of fake moves. <laughs> You know, somebody needs a new liver, and you just got a, a breast job. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, man, we'll see what happens this year. But Everton, I cannot give them anything more. No, I can't even go with D minus. I'm with you. I give them an F. Yeah. Because, I mean, they were they were too good to get relegated. And luckily for them, the rest of the Premier League was just kind of shitty this year. Mm-hmm. Or else, I mean that that should have been a that should have been a bottom bottom half of the table team. Yeah, I, I, they weren't I, that bad. It was just everyone below them was just bad this year. Uh, and, and and again, they they were in Europe and they 
horribly flamed <laughs> oh, out. They they lost out quickly. Well, purposely and horribly flamed out. Yeah, I, and and even then it's like, oh, the poison chalice. Oh, now we're free of Europe. It, it's not like they climbed back into the top seven or something. They are top six. No, I mean, I mean, even at that point, they weren't really in danger of relegation. You certainly weren't getting anywhere into the top six. Mm-hmm. So hell, why not just take a chance in Europe? Uh, but it's Big Sam and, and it's Everton. Everton. Everton are trying to act like a big club, but they're just, you know, we in our high school stuff, we, we've always talked about the, the culture of Nash Central, oh which has which has started to change since they finally seem to get the right coach in. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's been the problem for Everton is they, they've got this small club mentality, mm-hmm. even though they should be doing better than that. Mm-hmm. You know, like when Moyes was there, they were so happy with Moyes. The fans were and the board was because he didn't spend money and because um, he kept them, you know, they were, they, they were, they weren't getting embarrassed competitive. You know what I mean? They were decent. It's like they weren't competing. They weren't competing to win a title. Yeah. They were barely competing. You know, they, I think they finished a couple times in the champions league spot, mm-hmm. even though one year of all irony was uh, 2005, they finished fourth and then Liverpool won the champions league and took their spot. <laughs> Um, but you know, they, they, they had this mentality of, they were kind of like Arsene Wenger light. Mm-hmm. You know, Wenger was like, I just need to finish fourth. They were just like, we just need to finish sixth or seventh. And that's just the mentality they have. And really, yes, I think Silva's a quality managerial hire, mm-hmm. but until they really make some changes in that club, it's just who they are, man. It's just who they are. They, they have a, they have a shit culture. Well, he's he's going to be the one tasked with turning around, and he's done some pretty good work. Other places he's been, you know, take off that Watford spell because Watford's an insane place to manage, um, yeah. and and he's done pretty well. So he has a very big task, and I think part of the reason, and then we'll move on from Everton. It's 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 about how much again, it's how much money they spent this past season. They got this influx of oil money. They tried to make a bunch of money signings, but they didn't just splash the cash. They they just they were so bad about who they yeah. bought. Like it's not enough to just spend money. You actually have to they were spend so money shit about it. on good players that fit your system. And that's what Everton didn't do at all. So we'll see if they if they've learned their lesson. They got the manager in. I don't know if much else, so we'll we'll have to see though. Um, but And we'll finish off our look back for this week with our seventh place team and a fan base that I'm sure is now very, very happy with their manager. Uh, and that is little old Burnley. Burnley finishes in seventh place. Uh, they go 14, 12, and 12 on the season. Still finished with a negative goal differential. Only the top six had a positive <laughs> one. This kind of says all that needs to be said there. But, again, Burnley, they, they'll, they'll beat you 1-0, and that's all they looked at, went out to do. In fact, as I'm looking back on their Premier League matches this season, so far I see two matches they won by more than one goal. A, a 2-0 win at home to Swansea and a 3-0 win on the road at West Ham. Uh, which was played at some weird stadium. Um, other than that, every one of their wins was by one goal. A lot of them 1-0 wins. Um, this was a very limited club, scored only 36 goals, um, but also only gave up 39. Um, part of that Sean Dyche mentality, very, very strict with his goals. You know, you look at the team above them, Arsenal, they scored 74, but they also gave up 51. Although, anyway, um, you know, you look at Everton. Yeah, they scored 44. They gave up 58. So, you know, Burnley, very offensively limited. Uh, the second fewest goals in the top 10. Are, are, sorry, the fewest goals in the top 10. Only Newcastle was close to them with 39. But, um, 
nobody, I think, had any real expectations for this club. Uh, looking back, I had them finishing in 18th place. I thought they were going to get relegated, um, having just come back up from the championship. They didn't. They finished in the top seven. They're going to Europa. God bless you guys, because that's ooh, that's going to be interesting. Um, cause they still actually have to qualify through that. But just from the 2017-18 season, Wes, damn it, I'm giving Burnley an A. We're going from Everton an F to Burnley's getting an A. One spot difference in the table. I mean, you've got to. I mean, that was that was one of the most improbable. You know, take away what Lester did. Yeah. I mean, this is this was an improbable run by Burnley. And then especially when you sit there and look at the statistics. Yeah. Because statistically speaking, what the hell is this team doing anywhere near the top half of the, the league? Yeah. Much less in a European spot and, and much less comfortably in a European spot. Mm-hmm. I mean, Everton weren't close to them. Five points clear? Yeah. Um, I mean, it, it was amazing. I mean, they, this is a team that did it, you know, based on just being solid Strong at the back. Mm -hmm. Really, when you look at them, they almost, they vaguely mirror that Leicester squad that won the Premier League. Mm -hmm. The the biggest difference was they had nowhere near the creativity and goal scoring potential. No, no offensive firepower to speak. No, no. (laughs) And that's the thing. And and literally right now trying to think of it, I can't tell you who Burnley's, I can't tell you who scored goals for Burnley. (laughs) Um, let me see if I can even, let's see, we can sort by goals here. So this will, this will, oh no, we can't. Um, two <laughs> people, two people were in double digits. Uh, Ashley Barnes had 10 goals and that's in all competitions for them. Uh, had 10 goals and Chris Wood had 11. Oh, wow. And that's Chris Wood and Ashley Barnes. That's their, the next closest person in terms of goals was good old Sam Vokes who had four. Four. I think it's like a left back or something. Yeah. So 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 yeah. two people. So two people had more than five goals on this yeah. team, and they finished seventh. Yeah. <laughs> and ahead of Everton. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just love that part ahead of Everton. Oh, it's so good. Um, and you know, but when you look at it, this is a team that you hated to play. We remember a few years ago. I think I think a few seasons ago. Before they were relegated, they went like undefeated at Turf Moor. Yeah, um, and that is—it's a brutal place to go play, just because it's a brutal team to play at home mm-hmm. because they're so organized and they sit back. And, and I mean, hey, just just look at Liverpool's struggle currently mm-hmm. over the last few years, kind of as your example number one. Um, you know, it's it's a tough place to play. They have no problem giving you possession, um, begging you to keep the ball, and then just trying to nail you on a counter. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's effective. It's not pretty. Yeah, it's not <laughs> it's not what um, the TV uh, what the TV companies put the match on. It's not what Sky or you know NBC Sports are looking for. Oh, let's do a Burnley match. Yeah, but damn it, it's effective. And when you have a squad who is short on talent, doesn't have the explosive firepower, you know, you can't, they can't all be Liverpool and City. Yeah. So therefore everyone can't coach like Klopp and Potch and, um, and uh, Pet do. Everyone can't do that because they don't have the players those guys have. Uh, Sean Dyche knew what he had, went out and did a, Wonderful job of making it happen. And I think for Burnley, avoiding relegation would have been perfectly acceptable. And instead, this team finished at seventh, and they're uh, they're going to Europa. I'd give them an A. I mean, great season. Great season. Aesthetically, not a great season. But overall, um, in, in what really matters, great season. Yeah, absolutely. And again, for, for these fans, you know, this is this is an old club. They, they've been a club for – almost 140 years now um, to, to have this kind of a season is great. Now the, the one worry again, doesn't affect last year's grade at all, but the one worry you have is how does a team like this 
now continue forward while dealing with the Europa League. I well, here and here's here's the part that kind of sucks. Um, they have not made a signing all summer. Yeah, have not made a signing. So uh, ooh, take take it for what it's worth. Yeah, and uh, real quick, I feel like we should know who they're um and i just i'm not seeing it right now but i'm pretty sure we should know who their uh their their uh, europa league opponent is um because it's it's coming up i believe this uh tomorrow is when it starts so why can i not find that um oh um that's really weird i i assumed we could find them. Why can't we find them? Burnley Europa League. It's really weird. I, I should be able to. Uh... Oh, oh, that's right. Uh, Aberdeen. They're taking. They're taking on Aberdeen. Uh, uh, better Dean. Uh, Aberdeen. That's right. They play. Oh, uh, yeah. They play Aberdeen on Thursday of next. No. No, they play tomorrow. Yeah. It's, it's, and then their second leg is uh, next Thursday. Um, and then if they win that. Uh, they will actually get matched up with uh, um, what's the team out of uh, Istanbul? Um, uh, uh, Galatasaray? No, uh, it's uh, Fenerbahce. It's, it's uh, Basak Sahir. Basiktas? Not Basiktas. Jesus is, Christ! I named Istanbul. every Turkish team on that. Istanbul Basak Sahir. Istanbul. Yeah, okay. That's all we need to know. Uh, Edge, you said the magic word. Oh, God, no, what did I do? Um, so yeah, Bur- Burnley does have a, a decently tough road ahead of them because again, they're gonna have to start playing tomorrow <laughs> or today when you're listening to this. So there you go. Uh, with the second qualifying round, uh, then they'll have a third qualifying round. It looks like again against Istanbul, then it's a playoff round, and then it's group stage. So they have to get through three uh home and away ties before they can even get to the group stage. So it's that is that is a very tough way to begin your season if you're Burnley, but it's what they're going to have to do if they want to uh, if they want to uh, try to try to chase a title. And and I you never know, European glory. Ah, well, we love it. Um, so that's that's going to do it for our Premier League wrap up for this week. Again, next week we will hit the top six or the top <sighs> five plus one as as we're calling it now, uh, as, as it kind of was last year. Top five and Arsenal. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um, so we'll, again, we'll get to that next week. And so we can finally put a bow on the 2017, 18 premier league season. Like a week before the real. <laughs> yeah. It's That's crazy. our time. And that's how we roll. Yeah. It's usually how we do it. Hey, we would have recorded a podcast. I was planning on recording a podcast where we just did the entire <sighs> top half from Charlotte. That, but. that didn't come to pass. But yeah. 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 Um, so now we're going to hit the news and notes. Um, first story is a little weird. Um, kind of came out during the World Cup, but uh, it, it is now leaked into post-World Cupness. Um, obviously, Germany did not have a very good World Cup. Um, part of it may have been inner turmoil, uh, which, and as we are wont to do here on the Foreign Affair Podcast, no one loves pointing a finger more at Mesut Ozil than us. Um, but we may now have competition. Um, uh, German Football League president, this is the most German name ever, Reinhard Grindel. Reinhard Grindel! Yes, there, thank you. Uh, said he uh, basically had very bad things to say um, about Mesut Ozil for meeting with uh, Turkish president uh, Teop Erdogan who is a terrible human being and is basically turning his country into a dictatorship and is kind of awful. Um, but Arsenal, or, or Ozil, along with Ilkay Gundogan and Senk Tassan, uh, both met with him and gave him signed jerseys. So in Germany, with their relationship with Turkey, didn't really like that too much. Um, so again, he had these uh, fairly terrible uh, statements that he made. Um, Just their official statement was, the DFB, of course, respects the special situation for our players with migrant backgrounds. 
but football and DFB stands for values that Mr. Erdogan does not sufficiently respect. That's putting it mildly. Therefore, it is not a good thing that our internationals have let themselves be exploited for his election campaign stunt. It certainly hasn't helped the DFB's integration efforts. Uh, it should be noted Ozil is of Turkish descent. So there is a link there. Um, people like uh, uh, Germany general manager Olivier Bierhoff said uh, before the World Cup, or said after the World Cup, we never forced any player of the national team to do something, but we always tried to convince them. We haven't succeeded with Messit. That's why we should have thought about leaving him out from a sporting point of view. Um, so, so basically everyone at the DFB against uh, Ozil. And then, so he took out there a long note saying in part, quote, he would no longer stand for being a scapegoat for uh, the president's incompetence and his inability to do his job properly, which is funny because that's generally what we say about Mess at Ozil. Um, but, <laughs> but Wes, this is, this is kind of a serious issue. Uh, he has come out and said uh, he will not play for Germany as long as Grindel is still in position uh, as president of the Federation. Um, I got to be honest, if there's not much other backing and i haven't heard a ton of like other german players coming out for ozil maybe i just haven't seen it but i i haven't really myself seen any i kind of just feel like they might say well that's how you feel um thanks for everything we'll not call you for euros then i guess so i <laughs> I, I and, and I can I can kind of see where Ozil was coming from. I still think it was a stupid decision to go. I understand as as someone who does have split heritage, I I understand wanting to be closer to your roots. Um, but I would never take a picture with almost any Brazilian politician because if you think our American politicians are corrupt. Brazil is like on another level. Like we're double A compared to Brazil's major leagues. Um, so I would not do that. And and this man Erdogan is even worse than them. Like they're corrupt in a money way. He's corrupt in a I'm going to just oppress all of my people way. So again, I understand wanting to, as I believe Ozil said about his mom, never forget where it came from. I get that. Time and place, and just use a little common sense next time. So, and as far as his play, again, I don't think any of us will miss him. So, that that's my thoughts on it. Wes, I would love to hear your take, though. Well, Ed, you know, I agree. Never forget where you came from. I mean, my, my roots run deep. Yes. I'm an American from North Carolina. Yes, you are. And I'll never forget that, Ed. That's true. By God, I will never forget that. Um <laughs> You know, my, my issues with Mesut Ozil are infinite, it yes. seems. Yes. Um, on the field, I think, he, I think he lives on reputation on the field. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he lives on the reputation of that 2014 World Cup, um, of his early years in Germany, and of his run with, um, with Real Madrid. Mm -hmm. I think he lives off that. Um, and, and when it comes to the Premier League and Arsenal, I think he lives off a handful So sporting wise, my issue with him is he's lazy and inconsistent. Mm -hmm. And everybody will say, oh, well, look at his numbers from the World Cup. That's great. He had great numbers for the worst German team of all time. Good job. You're the tallest midget at the convention. I don't think that word's politically correct anymore, but oh, well, I'm American and I don't have to be politically correct. Thank you, Ed Green. Uh, but my my biggest issue here is Ozil did this. He knew there was going to be backlash. Yeah, I agree. And now he he goes to the old card that everybody wants to play nowadays. Uh, everyone's a racist. No, everyone's not a racist. 
They warned you not to do something, and you did it, and now you're suffering from the consequences. If if Wes Bradshaw, and as much as I love you, Wes Bradshaw, if, you if, if five... Mm, I'm trying to get my timeline right of when he died. If Let's just say, let's say I knew you ten years ago. And okay. Ten years ago, oh, of you, course. you so went much to go take a picture with Muammar Gaddafi. Okay. And then I knew about this. Uh-huh. And and back at my former job, my boss told me, "Hey, this West Bradshaw character, we're gonna get him to uh, to do high school football with you." And uh-huh. I knew, yeah, you were, you had done this with Omar Gaddafi. I would have oh. reservations. I would I would oh. be a little nervous because this is a terrible man and a brutal dictator. Maybe. Or even more than Gaddafi, let's say, you know, old Uncle Saddam. That, that's fair. That's him. Too. You know, something like that, or or even good old Vlad. Yeah, yeah. And I totally agree with you. You know, I mean, and uh, I mean, and the thing is, that's not to say, well, you know, Wes, you're a terrible person that you did this. But I'm sitting here thinking, man, this dude like supports Saddam Hussein or Muammar Gaddafi. Like, like, there's something that ain't right here. Like he could, if if Osul had gone to Turkey and gone and done a photo op at a a I, at a playground in Istanbul with twenty uh-huh. kids on a, on a, playing soccer with them, there uh-huh. I don't believe there'd be an issue here, and that mm-hmm. would also be honoring, not forgetting where you came from. But yeah. instead, you chose to go meet and glad hand with a brutal dictator. Like I'm sorry yeah. that. If you can't see the problem Germany has with you, then then I don't know what to tell you here. It, it, it just, well, it seems like common sense. And, and you know, th- we kind of had an issue somewhat similar to this during the World Cup, and it, it involved Mo Salah, mm-hmm. where I believe it was the the guy who's like running Chechnya, was that it? Uh, yeah. Was trying to ingrate, you know, um, because I Egypt played a match over there, and this guy basically tried to put himself on the most solid track, and like wanted you know, try, they tried to make Salah like an honorary Chechnyan, and basically wanted to honor him and do all these things. Mm-hmm. And Salah, you know, being more the maybe level-headed one, was kind of like, look, you know, I understand, and I'm hey, I'm honored, but no, no, we're not going to do that. Yeah, you know, I'm 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 not going to be, you know, I'm not going to be a Basically, a pawn in your game trying to have control over here. I'm not going to be right. that guy. Yeah. And that's more, you know, that, and now I know a little different. Salah has no real roots in Chechnya. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, um, you know, there, there's a way to handle these things. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know what? Here's the thing. If you want to get, you know, if he asks for a jersey, and okay, I'll give you a jersey. Mm-hmm. But I'm not taking, like, an official state picture with you. Mm-hmm. You know, you can be a fan, that's cool, but I'm not going to be, you know, my face isn't going to be popping up on political ads yeah. for you. Like, oh, this guy loves me and this guy loves me. Oh, the, the rich and famous of Turkey love me. We'll send you a jersey oh. via the, the post office. You'll, you'll get it in four to six weeks. Don't worry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, um, it was just, you know, for, for Ozil, he made a bad decision. And what have we talked about on this show, Ed? You can make decisions, but then you have to live with the consequences of your decisions. Mm-hmm. And for Ozil, you know, you're talking about a guy who's already kind of polarizing in Germany mm-hmm. just for the way that he acts, the way he plays for the national team, the way he does different things. He's already somewhat polarizing and not really a fan favorite. Mm-hmm. And now you go and you do this. Mm-hmm. And then you're just appalled that, oh, my God, how dare someone call me out on this? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it was a poor decision, and he had to live with his decision. You know what? Gundogan did the same thing. Gundogan isn't – Gundogan's not facing the same backlash Mm -hmm. because he also doesn't have the record of Mm -hmm. of just being that guy. Mm -hmm. So – you know, your decisions come back and they build up and things happen. And, you know, at the end of the day, Ozil's kind of taking his ball and going home, which I personally think is really good for Germany in general. 
but um, you know, you you lay in the bed that you make. And and I do want to say, I I have no doubt that some of the abuse he's probably taken is probably racially motivated. I know we we like to use the word racially to describe uh, whites yeah. and blacks in America. Racially has some different tones it can go through in, in Europe because, yeah. because of the way yeah. they are. Um, Racially, culturally, yeah. however you want to look at it. So I, I, I don't doubt that some of it is that he's a foreigner and it's easy to blame the foreigner. I, mm. I, I do empathize with that point. What I will not empathize with that point is that if you are already getting these sorts of negative attitudes toward you justify or not if you if you are already getting this why would you do something to just prove everybody's point there you go like that's i mean yeah why would you why would you do something yeah yep that's what we figured that's that's what i don't that's that's what i i think really strikes me is not that he might even be wrong that some of it is racially motivated he might be totally Mm -hmm. right but it's like there was a really easy way to avoid this and that's by Mm -hmm. not meeting with a brutal dictator and yeah i mean it's like it's justifying the stereotype yeah if that's what it is it's justifying the stereotype yeah so i and and dave Chappelle did an extremely controversial skit about this many years ago (laughs) which one was that I don't remember, which one uh, the Racial Pixies. Racial Pixies. I don't remember this one. Oh, it was one of the late ones. It was one of the ones that uh, really some shit. Where, uh, yeah, it was it was a special one. one of the, I think it's hilarious. It was a magnificent skit. It was just it. It was so right there on that line. And Dave may have crossed the line, but hey, I'm a huge Dave fan, so oh, you are. It was um, great. Uh, you know, I got to see him do his white guy. So. You know who else might be a, a big Shock. Jay fan is uh, maybe Raheem Sterling. Um, uh, Raheem's Raheem's a baby. He he has not do it. We got to we got to introduce Raheem to Dave. Remember, Chappelle. he was like eight years old when Dave Chappelle. Was uh, I feel so old now. Um, but Raheem Sterling uh, might be feeling a little older now. That city might start shopping him around. This kind of came a little bit out of nowhere. Um, apparently. Uh, Raheem Sterling and his agent uh, wanted to negotiate. Good old 80 Ward, public enemy number one in Liverpool. Wanted to uh, do some negotiations uh, after the World Cup, you know, get that new deal going that's right now going through 2020. Say, hey, you know what? We're going to use the, the the good showing we're going to have at the World Cup as leverage. I'm starting mm-hmm. starting winger for England. We're, this is going to be great. And then the World Cup happened and Raheem Sterling was super bad. So, As we covered in detail. And, and as a tweet from BBC Live, Five Live Sport put out, uh, City's attacking options. Sané, Aguero, Jesus, Bernardo Silva, Sterling, and Mares. Like, they could probably do without Raheem Sterling at this point. So and, now you and don't think they won't go get someone else if they feel they need he did score 23 girl goals for the citizens last year. You no, know, undoubtedly his best season in the yeah. Premier League, um, oh, yeah. which I think is where some of the shock is coming from. But now all of a sudden he might be potentially on his way out. Um, so, or it could be even be next summer. That this yeah, well, and what they said, it won't be this summer. Yeah. Um, basically they're going to give him a year and see where they stand next summer. But um yeah, basically what it was was City had offered a contract extension uh, before the World Cup, and um, his agent, A.D. Ward, who, <laughs> like I said, folks, that is a curse word on the red side of Mersey, the way he handled the original Sterling deal. Um, you know, he thought he was going to play hardball with City. And, so, and from from what we understand, arrogantly – made the statement of, oh, no, we're going to wait till I go up and you're going to have to pay us then. Which, I mean, is just... I, I, A.D. Ward, so many people think he has hurt Raheem Sterling's career more than he's helped it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, certainly certainly has made him a lightning rod. Yeah. And this, I mean, Raheem Sterling's already a lightning rod in England, and this is just another... 
It's just another notch on that rod. Oh, uh, Raheem Sterling's rod. Well, we'll have to see if he can uh, if he can uh, score enough goals to justify his price tag and perhaps an extension. Where next yeah. summer he could be. Uh... And I mean, here's here's my question. Like we said, you know, they brought in Mar. I want to see how soon it is before Morris is just taking his minutes. Yeah. It's I mean, you know, Morris, Morris is a different kind of player than Sterling. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, they pretty much play the same position. Yeah. They play out on the right wing. So, uh, mm-hmm. you know, okay. maybe, it, maybe it wasn't your best idea to, you know, shit on this contract mm. uh, when they're bringing in another guy who plays your position for oh. big money. Oh, Raza. We, we, Some, somewhat of a misstep, Eddie. It was so much fun supporting you for those two weeks. Um, all right. Uh, now let's head to a, a transfer that has actually happened. And Wes, one you mentioned earlier, uh, Everton. Woo! Let's hope this one sticks. Uh, this might actually be a good one, though. They signed Ricarlison uh, from Watford on a five-year contract worth a reported potential £40 million. And this is... This is a decently high amount of money, like a lot of last year's signings for Everton. But uh, <sighs> this was a guy who, while Marco Silva was at Watford, played really well for him. But after Marco Silva left, played very poorly. According to Dale Johnson over at ESPN, he sent out a tweet. Um, I'm sorry, uh, not, uh, yes, Dale Johnson. Um, this is a player who last scored for Watford on November 19th and didn't give an assist out after December 12th. So he has not given a goal or assist this calendar year. Um, So that's very interesting. Um, Which, so on the one hand, it's obvious this guy has a very good relationship with Silva. He was very unhappy when he left. So there's, I'm sure, a lot of hope that he can reclaim some of that magic with Everton. What this also tells me, though, is that this seems like a very mercurial person. And that if things don't go well at Everton early, they could be in trouble. So this could be a sign in, hey, we're talk to Jurgen Klopp. We know that prices are going up every year in the Premier League. Um, but this so this is one deal that could work out really well for Everton. It could also end really, really badly. I mean, it just to me it comes down once again to the fact that Sales for a player who was not in demand, mm-hmm. a player who played, who's had three good months in the Premier League, mm-hmm. um, and you basically you truck forty million on him. It uh, it's a big number. Even I mean, even this day and age, I mean, a twenty-one year old Brazilian who I don't think's ever been capped, mm-hmm. may or may not. He he may have been capped. He may have played. Uh, I, think, I think I think he was. Uh... I think maybe he, was he did, with, maybe he got called up last year. I think he was with reason. them at the Confederation Cup. Okay, okay. Um, but I mean, still for a guy who, to me, has not proven himself over a season. You, you know, I mean, when you look at say Liverpool putting out that money for Allison, mm-hmm. and people, go, oh, well, he, he's you know he's only played one year at this level, but yeah, but he was also like one of the dominant best players in Europe at his position all season. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, all season. I mean, from starting in, in the Champions League, in Syria, in the um, the uh, Copa, whatever they play in Syria, a guy who's also you know the unquestioned number one uh, for his country, as Allison is. You know, for him, yeah, you know, you you pay that big money for Richarlson. To me, it feels like Everton, and that's Everton's first and only signing of the summer to this point. Everton were desperate to do something. Mm-hmm. Um, they brought in Marco Silva. Silva's like, oh, yeah, yeah, I like this kid. Yeah, we did good work last year. So he says, all right, got to get him, whatever the price. Mm-hmm. And I think Whopper just sat back. You know, Whopper's kind of like, uh, how about give us $50 million for him? Yeah, yeah. Well, we'll give you 40 Okay, cool. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and Whopper's just sitting back going, well, damn, that was a hell of a deal. <laughs> um, and now Everton have a guy who, you know, I mean, maybe maybe he kicks on, but, I mean, this is a – I mean, he wasn't a great scorer. He wasn't a great assist guy. He 
was for three okay. months under under yeah, Marcus. It was for three months. <laughs> so, I mean, they're really they seem to like really be believing. Mm. You know, Marco Silva is the guy. So, yeah. okay, good luck with that, Everton. We'll see. It's still still a lot of holes for Everton to fill, though. Um, real quick, I do a couple more signings here. Um, Andre Schurl is uh, heading back to the Premier League this time with Fulham coming over on a two-year loan. Uh, and uh, João Moutinho, uh, the Portuguese player, is uh, heading over to Wolves. So a couple of the, uh, the newly promoted uh, teams in the Premier League so making some more um, big the, signings. The Moutinho, I mean, that kind of continues what we'll with um, Love you know, with that that Portuguese connection they've got, yeah, uh, with with not Mina Real, who's who's the agent, um, Jorge Mendes. Mm-hmm. They've kind of got, they've got that relationship with him, and this uh, you know Mendes, uh, this pretty much is a Mendes player, um, and they got him for such a good price. Mm-hmm. See, I mean, that's the thing. Get him from get him from Monaco and. I mean, you know, a guy, Giamatino has proven himself. Giamatino has been a really good player for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, and Wolves, I'm going to tell you, man, Wolves are doing really good to start with coming up. Mm-hmm. And I think they've done nothing but improve that team over the summer. This is why I keep saying, like, these signings, Fulham and, and uh, Wolves both making moves, this is going to be a very tough Premier League. Like, oh man, and Fulham. I mean, you start looking at what Fulham's done. I mean, Andre Sherl is a guy who, yeah, you know, with Chelsea he wasn't great. But what have we seen with former Chelsea guys? Yeah, you know, sometimes it's more the environment and not the uh, it's De Bruyne, Salah. <laughs> um, you know, Daniel Sturridge was a former Chelsea guy who never really got a chance. Um, I mean, there there's been a few of them. Uh, Sherla, I think it's a really, really good loan signing. I think it's a really good deal Mm -hmm. uh, for him because, I mean, we know Andre Sherla has been a quality player. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's a loan. So, you know, if it sucks, you can terminate the loan or you don't have to worry about playing him. But I think they have a potentially, you know, really good player uh, coming into full. I think they're doing really good work this summer. Yeah, absolutely. Some some big deals going there. We talked about one last week, uh, the French winger. Uh, Jean-Michael Seri. Yes, Seri coming over. So so, so Fulham make, making some moves. Very, very impressive to see. Uh, Those two teams are definitely looking to stay up. <laughs> and then there's, uh, there's Cardiff. Yeah. There's hey, Cardiff. hey, Cardiff. Um, you have the Millennium. Hey, are, are you guys still wearing uh, red for blue or blue for red? I don't know. Oh, so weird. Um, so here was the deal that uh, we don't normally go out of the Premier League that much. Uh, but when a story like this breaks, this is, this is, this is just too delicious. Um, so uh, Roma, who's currently playing Tottenham Hotspur in the International Champions Cup, um, thought they were getting Malcolm. He was Which, by the way, Everton thought they were getting him first. Yeah, yeah. No, that, <laughs> that, that didn't happen. Uh, thought he was coming over from Bordeaux. Um, People, he the plane tickets were lined up. He was about to get on the plane. Fans were waiting at the airport in Rome, ready to greet Malcolm coming over. And right before he got on the flight, Barcelona was like, "Hey, you wanna you wanna come over here? You wanna want to play with Messi? You want to come play with Messi? You wanna you wanna you wanna you want to play with Luis and not beaten?" We had this guy named Polino. He went back to China for some reason. You want to come play with us? So, ah, I, you know, we, we, I, I like the, I like the word gazump. Uh, this, this mm-hmm. was a gazumping. Um, yeah. But I will say this to, and I, I know that obviously the entire board at Barcelona are listening. Don't you Ouch. ever bitch about someone coming after one of your players ever a fucking again. You don't get to do it. You're done. You're done. Stop it. That said, I found this entire thing hilarious. I mean, you just look at Barca over the last year, you know, first the whole song, Coutinho. Yeah. I mean, how they freaking unsettled Coutinho. Um, you know, and now they've turned around and done this, and it's just like, uh, Wow. Okay, Marcia. But that said, you know what? To me, transfers, I mean, it's all fair in love of war when it comes to the transfers. 
Um, you know, Malcolm felt maybe he got a better deal. Um, hell, Bordeaux got a better price. Yeah. That was all Bordeaux was looking for. Bordeaux was like, oh, shit, where are you going? Just pay us. <laughs> and Barcelona summed up some extra cash. Um, so Malcolm goes to Barcelona now. This is a guy I know a little about Malcolm. Um, he, was, he was actually pretty hardly connected with Liverpool back in the January window mm-hmm. uh, when we were looking to maybe bring in some attacking reinforcements. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's one, you know, I, I kept an eye on him for about a week or two during that point. Uh, they say he's very fast, very good dribbler, very good passer. Um, you know, he's a guy who creates a ton of opportunities. You know, basically, at Barcelona, it seems like he has a chance to come in and really do something. Mm-hmm. Now, the thing where this has people thinking, he pretty much plays the same position as Ousmane Dembele. Yeah. They're pretty much the same age. Yeah. I mean, are you going out and buying two high-priced kind of prospects? I think you put a lot more money really into Dembele than I mean, Dembele is a hundred million pound player. Yeah, uh, had a really, really shitty first season with Barcelona, and now the you know there's just more talk that maybe he could you know try to force a move out of Barca. Mm-hmm. So, you know, to me, unless Barcelona had an idea, I don't understand why they made this move. But I guess we'll just have to see what happens over the next month or in the transfer window. Yes, because again, um, theirs doesn't close on, yeah, on August 10th. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, the international one runs till later in the year, or uh, runs all the way through. So, uh, we'll have to see, but it's almost like Barcelona kind of made this move. Okay, but why? Yeah. Why did you make this move? So, we'll see, I guess. Yeah, it's going to be, as, as most things, very interesting. And and finally, tonight in our news and notes, uh, because we can't have nice things, and because nothing means anything anymore, um, last week, I believe, or two weeks ago, we told you that uh, AC Milan was going to be banned from the Europa League due to financial fair play, and we were like, yes, finally, FFP has real consequences for teams. They're, they're actually booting people from European competition, City. PSG, take note, this will happen to you, except it won't because Milan's going to get the play in the Europa League. Uh, they took it up with the court of arbitration. Ooh, for- lucky them, yay! <laughs> really, it's a worse punishment at this point. It's all they ever wanted. Um, so they, they took it up with the court of arbitration for sport, and the, the arbitrators ruled that uh, because uh, all the... Uh, problems came before the change in ownership uh, to Elliott Management. They mm-hmm. decided to let them back in. So ne- noting that the sanctions need to be more proportionate. This, according to Matt Jones at Bleacher Report. Um, so, yay, good, good sure. on you guys. Great, nothing matters. So, in the words of Ricky Bobby's youngest, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't – it's kind of like, oh, wait, oh, well, that did happen on the old uh, – okay. You know, basically, here's the thing. How do you feel about it? Because this is how the NCAA should operate. Mm-hmm. You know, the NCAA loves to slap, um, you know, uh, bans and uh, recruiting uh, punishments on all these teams of things that happen under, like, old regimes. Mm-hmm. But it's like, you know, I mean, you know, uh, take Butch Davis at Miami. We'll just look at him as one. You know, Butch Davis didn't have the recruiting violations, but damn it, he had to deal with the fallout of it. Yeah. And obviously that's happened in a lot of college football. The Joe Paterno Um, and Penn State debacle. Yeah, you know, James Franklin didn't do shit. He didn't molest nobody. He didn't cover anything up, but damn, he had to deal with it. So, I mean, maybe FIFA's got it right or UEFA or whoever this court appeals (laughs) <laughs> Maybe I, they got it right. You know what? Don't screw the people who are there. Screw you know. Go back and counteractively screw the other people. No. Even though I don't know how you can. So. No, I don't want to hear that. Oh damn it! Just when I thought they were doing something right with this shit. Uh never, never again. 
All right, well, that's going to take us uh, from news and notes into the watch for Wes. What have you been watching in the week? The watch oh, the week I've watched so much stuff this so week. Much. Um, we've got the, uh, I believe it's the season finale of six coming up. Uh, I think that was tonight, actually. I think I've got it recorded, mm. which makes me super excited. Uh, History Channel's um, show on SEAL Team 6. Um, SEAL Team is... 6, very hot property. Oh, my God. They have like their, uh, they have two of their own shows for the organization that they exist. Mm. Uh, except when they accidentally say, oh, yeah, yeah, they exist, just under a different name. Oh, Jesus. Come on, Navy. Do better. Um, but that, that's a great show. I love that show. It's one of my favorites. Uh, so I've been watching that. That's coming up on a season finale. Um, God dang it. There's something else starting on September 4th that I forgot about. And now I forgot what it was. Of course, we talked last week about Mayans coming. Basically, everything's starting the first week of September, which has me jacked. Um, Movie-wise, I saw three movies in the past week. Oh, boy. Uh, we saw the Hotel Transylvania 3. Yeah. Pretty funny. Pretty cute. Uh, you know, obviously took the kid. I uh, saw the first Purge. Oh. Um, which, if you're into the Purge, I'm Purgeman. Um, definitely has an agenda. <laughs> um, definitely very uh, Black Lives Matter agenda on this. Um, but an entertaining movie nonetheless. Um and then today, I went and saw one I've been really itching to see. I went and saw The Equalizer 2 with Denzel. Didn't even know there was an Equalizer 1. Oh, God, it was great. Uh, I mean, it's Denzel. It basically Denzel. No, I, I, I saw the preview. They, they showed the uh-huh. preview before Ant-Man. So I knew oh, the yeah. movie. I just didn't realize there was a first one. Yeah, it came out in 2014. I just recently saw the first one. I knew about it. I just recently saw it. Um, I mean, Denzel's basically... He's kind of like an older um, Jason Bourne, mm-hmm. almost. Yeah. It's it's like, you know, whatever you do, don't fuck with this man. <laughs> because ba- he's kind of like Jason Bourne, John Wick, kind of. Yeah. It's like, don't fuck with this dude because bad shit's going to happen don't to you. Don't kill his dog. Yeah, you know, like, don't kill his friend. And don't, you know, don't, um, don't, don't like beat up hookers and stuff like that. Or else you'll have to deal with general that. rule in life. Don't. Yeah, general rule in life. Don't kill people's friends. Yeah. It's brilliant. I mean, God, I have this tattooed on my back. Weird. <laughs> Rules number one and number two. <laughs> number three, never trust Alex Ferguson. That's my other one. But anyway, oh. um, but I thought it was fun. It was. I mean, it's not going to win an Oscar by any means. Mm-hmm. But I, I like Denzel. I've always liked Denzel Washington. Um, and he gives a great Denzel performance, and he fucks some people up. And you know that I love seeing people get fucked up. There you go. So uh, uh, I recommend it. Equalizer two. Uh, I am. I'm not watching. I'm. Well, I guess I'm technically watching uh, because both myself and one name technical producer Jackie are playing a new game that came out for the Switch just a couple weeks ago. The Nintendo Switch um, called Octopath Traveler. Uh, super dumb name. Um, but really, let's really say that does that sound interesting at all? <laughs> it's a, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, it's a very old school uh, JRPG sort of game, throwback to the Super Nintendo era uh, of games. Uh, but it's very cool. It's uh, there's eight main characters, and each one of them have just kind of their own story. And you can you pick you start the game, you pick one, you start their story, and then it's up to you if you want to go on to their second part of their story. If you want to go check out this person's first part of their story, do whatever you want. Just make the way through the game as you want. Get it? There's eight. So it's eight paths. Octo, path, traveler, because you travel across the world. Oh, it's great. Uh, very fun game, though, I, I must say. It's, um, it's, it's very, very fun. Um, but Wes, um, I, I need to ask you, are you, have a, you are a PlayStation 4 owner, correct? Uh, I am. Okay. Owner of, owner of one game. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's uh, FIFA 18, isn't it? Uh, it's FIFA 17, okay. and it will soon be FIFA. There you go. So you can get FIFA 19. Um, so. I have a game recommendation for you, since you are, you are also a fan of, of this. Especially since you just brought up the Equalizer. Um, uh, I would recommend a game that is called 
Detroit colon become human. Oh god. And the problem I, I want to that, recommend- that sounds more like a slogan for the city, but anyway. Oh, um, I, I want to recommend this game to you, but I also want to like watch you play it. Um, because I really want to be in the room. It's a it's a very interesting game, uh, made by one uh, noted great. Mm, that didn't feel right to say. Uh, interesting French game designer David Cage. Jesus like Christ, and he's French. What are you trying to do to me? Um, it's a story. Okay, so here's the story. Um, you play three different characters. Um, you play one is an android who uh, tries to break free and start a revolution for the androids. One is a cop who is an android who is hunting down other bad androids. And a third is a female android who has a daughter that she runs away from an abusive person with and doesn't really matter. Kara is not really important to the story. What is important, though, is Marcus and Connor. And it's there's a lot of like great things about this game, and it's one of those, uh, it's almost like a choose your own adventure game. You know, they'll, you'll get button prompts of how do you want to answer this question? Uh, how do you want to interrogate this victim? Which victim do you, or which suspect do you want to interrogate? Do you want to interrogate them aggressively? Do you want to uh, be reassuring? Do you want to just straight up probe their mind? Because you're an android, you can do that. Um, but it's, it's, it's graphically, it's amazing. Sound is amazing. The characters, a couple of them are actually pretty great. Um, and there's some notable people in it. Um, uh, fuck, she dated Derek Cheater for a time. Um, Minka that does Ke- not narrow anything down, but okay. Minka Kelly is oh, in it. Minka Kelly is, is actually in it. Uh, one of the guys uh, from Grey's Anatomy, uh, Jesse... Mick what? Yeah, one of them. Uh, uh, Je- I, I know his first name is Jesse. I forget his last name. Uh, he's in there. He plays one of the main characters. Uh, and what's his face from Alien? Um, shit. Oh, God. Oh, God. I, I forgot his name. I, it's on Not the Michael Bain. Not Michael Bain. Um, oh, shit. Oh, God. This is terrible. I can't believe I have to actually look this up. Um... Carl from Detroit. This is a great podcast. Yeah, it is. Uh, Detroit. Uh, Lance Lance Hendrickson. Lance Hendrickson. I didn't even oh, have to okay. look, finish looking up. Lance Hendrickson is in it. Um, so there are some like name talents. Um, there's a lot of great things about this game, but and there is a lot of like maddening things about this game. Um, I can even give you if you want to play it. There's a bingo card that you can use to play uh, to to keep track of as you play through the game. Um, very exciting. Uh, I've I've watched multiple playthroughs because um, there's so many different endings you can get. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I I can't believe it. Yeah, go play Detroit Become Human if you kind of hate yourself. I seriously keep forgetting that Detroit's an American city. Oh, it's it's so close to Canada, which is a plot point, by the way. Oh God! And you have thrown in here Detroit, Canada, and France. And you're expecting me to go play this game. Um, and Androids. There's a Blade Runner reference. Because of course they would be. Interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's, uh, wait, wait. You're slowly bringing me around. Okay, yeah. Um, and actually, like, uh, the, the one one of the stories between Connor, the, the police android, and his um, uh, detective, he's like the old curmudgeon guy, their relationship, at least if you treat him well, their relationship is actually really good to watch. And it really grows. This is one of those old commercial detectives who's like, oh, I hate androids. Fuck that shit. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, and, and depending on how you play, uh, he actually becomes a guy who could potentially like really care about androids and see like they're because they become sentient or as they say, become human. Um, and there's also just one moment um, because uh, the android that starts the revolution is a dark-skinned android. Um, oh, and there's one, one of those. There's one moment 
when you there's one scene when you can choose to graffiti digitally graffiti a wall with your camp's slogan of you know we're free or we are alive and one of the choices <laughs> is um i had a dream oh god and i was like oh fucking christ it's it's again it's a great game and it's a maddeningly awful game that i cannot recommend enough for people to go play so it's that's all i'm gonna say so speaking of brilliant and also mind-numbingly terrible wes let's evolve into so raw jesus christ what a segue into that go play detroit oh okay <laughs> um you, we touched on this uh, we teased this very early in the show uh huge announcement this week from wwe stephanie mcmahon vince mcmahon triple h all in the ring monday night to start raw um, we are getting a women's only pay-per-view mm. um, that apparently is going to have 50 females in it. Uh, this is going to be, I believe, in October, and it's going to be called Evolution. Um, uh, 50 females, that, that kind of means they're going to have to uh, they're going to have to dip deep into the roster. They're going to have to go into NXT. Of course, you know, we had a Women's Royal Rumble where we saw them kind of have to dip into the roster. I'm also wondering now if they're going to go in with some of the legends, mm-hmm. which would be cool. I mean, hey, I'm never a person to um, not want to see Trish Stratus. <laughs> yeah. She's actually going to be in Raleigh this weekend. Unfortunately, Wes is working for Comic-Con, which kind of sucks. <laughs> yeah. Because I really, really kind of wanted to go see Trish Stratus and pay my money for that. But anyway. Uh, I digress. You know, you give me Trish Stratus, you give me, um, you give me Kelly Kelly, uh, Michelle McCool, some of those. Hey, I am totally down with it. Um, I'm kind of excited to see it. Uh, the women's, the women have done some good work in WWE, mm-hmm. some better than others over time. Uh, as you know, I'm a huge Alexa Bliss fan. Yes. Didn't turn on. Thank you. Um, <laughs> you know, big fan of her. Um, you know, Charlotte Flair. Uh, they're, they're definitely some female. So, I mean, I'm looking forward to it. That and also uh, you know, my six-year-old daughter who kind of has a, um, you know, really likes wrestling when she likes wrestling kind of <laughs> deal with her. Uh, she was kind of excited to hear about it. So, hey, you know, it might be a pay-per-view me and her could watch together. So uh, definitely looking forward to that. That'll be coming up in October. Uh, but before then, folks, we are on the road to SummerSlam. We're, we're about a month out. I think we've got four more weeks till SummerSlam. Uh, and we are, we're, we're definitely getting some matches set up. Uh, this week, we found out our two uh, championship matches. Um, that's right. Brock Lesnar will actually defend the Universal title. Ooh. Oh, my God. I know. I'm so shocked myself. <laughs> Considering he hasn't wrestled since WrestleMania. Um, Lesnar's going to fend, and uh, over the last couple of weeks, Ed, we had six guys who were up for the fight, for the spot to fight Brock Lesnar. You know, great spot. We could do some things, and instead, we're going to get Roman Reigns mm. because everyone's so excited to see Roman Reigns versus Brock Lesnar again in matches that haven't interested us to start with, like. WrestleMania. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, right now that's the standing. Of course, they're saying, well, it could be a triple threat because Bobby Lashley. Oh, my God. Bobby Lashley is actually more boring than Roman Reigns. On the mic, charisma-wise, whatever. Um, I just, I don't want to see Reigns Lesnar again because I've seen Reigns Lesnar. It seems like a million times. Um. But, you know, it's what it is, man. Man, it's what it is. You but go. you know what I am excited for at SummerSlam? What's that? As usual, SmackDown's giving me a better option <laughs> because we found out we're getting AJ Styles for Samoa Joe for the WWE title at SummerSlam. Ooh-hoo. Now, uh, for those of you, obviously, who uh, didn't watch any of the old TNA, AJ Styles and Samoa Joe is like money. 
It is a fantastic match. We've seen it. We saw it in TNA. We loved it in TNA. Uh, we saw so many different versions of it. They are phenomenal. And now we're going to get to see them go over the WWE title. I am I'm totally stoked about that, man. That is going to be great. That is going to be great. So that's going to make SummerSlam great. SummerSlam is shaping up. we got a lot of different things going on. Kevin up, Braun Strowman. Um, uh, looks like we're, uh, you know, tag team titles should be up for grabs, should be in- interesting. Um, I believe we're going to get Dolph Ziggler, Seth Rollins again for the Intercontinental title, which should be really good. I mean, those two are so good just individually, and you put them together and they do a really good job. I mean, there's a lot coming up, man, and that's what WWE does. WWE delivers on their big shows. It's just their damn week to week has been so shit lately. But this week wasn't bad. I happened to watch both shows last week. I was happy, pretty happy with both of them, even though Raw three hours is still the – that's like the damn Baton death march. I'm trying to get through Raw three hours on Monday night. Whatever. But, uh, yeah, that's your big stuff this week. So we've got title matches for SummerSlam, and we've got uh, Evolution coming up. So um, solid week, WWE. Let's just see. You know, the thing with WWE, WWE is really good on big announcements. Mm-hmm. problem is, man, they just – they let the week-to-week minutia, the stuff that makes it great, they let that go too much, man. Like I said, they deliver on the big shows. But, you know, what makes NXT so good is that every time you see those guys, it's like it matters on the TV show. Mm-hmm. So they're able to build something because everything matters, because they're not totally overexposed. Everything on Raw and SmackDown, not so much, but everything on Raw is just so overexposed. Yeah. Just because there's so much damn time they have to fill. So. <sighs> Whatever. Here we go. I'm, I'm, I'm getting pretty. You know, maybe my midsummer doldrums have uh, have left me. So, so who are we? Who are we pushing this year for SummerSlam? Um, definitely Styles and Samoa Joe. Okay, but just as a person, um, let's push. Um, because we've pushed Roman Reigns, and that's just bad. That was the yeah. I, I wanted to push for a return of Dean Ambrose. Oh, Dean Ambrose has been out way too long now. He should have been back. By- so I've got to figure they're saving him either for SummerSlam or the night after SummerSlam. So WWE, give us back our Dean Ambrose. There you go. All right. Done. Dean Ambrose is the one. That's 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 what I'm saying right the now. The one. The one. He is the one. <laughs> Thanks, Lawrence Fishburne. Um, so <laughs> just just like that, we are we are down to the last one thing of the podcast, which is to tell you guys adios. Um, this has been uh, episode 220 of the A Foreign Affair podcast. Once again, brought to you by NGSC Sports at NGSCSports.com. We never stop, even if this podcast is about to. You can find them on the Twitterverse. You can also find us on there as well. Uh, as a collective, we are at AFA Pod. Wes, you are. I'm at Wes Bradshaw21. I am at Edward Green. You can also find us via Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Uh, by our parent show, the All New Sports Show. You can also email us there, All New Sports Show at gmail dot com. Um, also, thanks to our podcast providers, including Podbean dot com, Stitcher, Spreaker, iHeartRadio, the TuneIn Radio app, the Google Play Music Store, and iTunes Music. Uh, we will be back next week to wrap up the top six of the Premier League. It'll finally be done. Uh, we'll have more news and notes. I'm sure there'll be more deals getting signed. Uh, as well as another edition of Watch 4 and uh, a recap of Evolution. That, that is this... No. No, no, it's not going to be until October. Never mind. Uh, so, yeah, we're not recapping that for a while. So, so Raw will just continue to be. Um, but that that is what's coming up next week. But until then, Wes, before we get out of here, do you have anything else you'd like to add? I want to give a shout-out to my personal favorite Major League Baseball player, Brian Goodwin. Um, is now a Kansas City Royal Mm -hmm. after a trade this week. So uh, Kansas City may not know. They got a pretty sweet little Rocky Mountain connection going there Mm -hmm. uh, between Brian Goodwin and their second baseman, Whit Merrifield, whose dad was a state, also a state champion as a Rocky Mountain Griffon. There you go. So there you go, folks. I've got my connections all over the place. But uh, definitely hoping Brian... uh, Brian got traded this week uh, from Washington to Kansas City. 
So definitely with uh, Kansas City's outfield situation, hoping Brian's going to get a lot more run and uh, maybe be able to establish himself as an everyday major league player. Hey, best of luck to him. Um, now, now with uh, the rebuilding that's going on in Kansas City, uh, maybe he's uh, he'll finally get to uh, spread his wings and fly. He's, he's a peacock. You got to let him fly, Captain. <laughs> got to let him fly, Captain. Um, and the last few days, he's uh, – <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, he played. Uh, he played the last two games. It looks like for him uh, on the twenty third against two for two, mm. and on the twenty fourth against Detroit was uh, one for three with an RBI. So uh, nice. three hits in his first five at bat. It's not bad. Very very cool. Uh, so good good job there, Brian, adjusting to life very well after the trade. Good, very very mature to to see that. So great job. Brian. So for Brian Goodwin, who's always welcome on the podcast, McCall, nice. Wes Bradshaw, I am Edward Green. Thank you so much for joining us here on the AFA pod. We'll be back next week. But until then, stay safe and try to enjoy this B rated international champion crap cup football. And good night, Charlotte. I hear you guys did a nice job again. Yeah, well, they always did. We never doubted that. We never doubted you. We never doubted you. You're listening to NGSC Sports Radio. Hear us live on NGSCSports.com where you can get awesome analysis for all things sport. Or check out our podcasts on iHeartRadio, Spreaker, iTunes, TuneIn, and much more. For our latest videos, head to NGSC Sports' YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter at NGSC Sports and like us on Facebook. NGSC Sports. We never stop.